I do think it'd be helpful to pray if we get started. Let's do that. Father, in our human wisdom and our human understanding, we really can't fathom spiritual truths or the spiritual world. So we need your Holy Spirit to be our teacher, to open our eyes to fresh ways of looking at things and perhaps to be motivated in a fresh way as well. Thank you so much for the book of First Peter, what it has to teach us, and we pray for clarity of understanding tonight. In Christ's name, amen. Well, what I'm going to share with you tonight uh, has changed more lives in, uh, in my ministry uh, than anything but the gospel itself. Um, I remember a young tennis pro came to my church and wanted me to disciple him and teach him how to study the Bible. And we spent some time together. When I shared the truth I'm going to share with you tonight, he said, oh my gosh. And so he took his tennis racket and took off to support himself by teaching tennis lessons and becoming a pastor. And, and now he's on staff with our school. His name is Dwight Edwards. Another young man was in high school and came to me and said, please teach me the Bible. We spent some time together. I shared this truth. and He said, oh my gosh. So he said he wanted to become as much like Jesus as he could. So he gave his life to healing uh, physically and spiritually. And uh, the first thing he did was go to medical school became a renowned medical doctor, a hand surgeon. And as a hand surgeon, he had a number of inventions in that field. And then he went on to theology, got a uh, THM, uh, that's a Master of Theology. Then went over to England, to Oxford, and got a, uh, what they call a DPhil over there, what we call a PhD. And now he teaches for our school. What is it that these young people heard? What is it that uh, so reoriented their lives? Well, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We call the uh, title of this study in the book, Saving the Saved. Well, that sounds kind of redundant, doesn't it? Or at least paradoxical. How can you save the saved? And it's because the uh, word saved is used a number of different ways in the New Testament. Uh, let me give you an example here. We'll go to my... Uh, Rusty Logos. And if we were to go over to uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save people from their sins. Okay? What is that? That's saving from their sins so what? They can go to heaven when they die, right? Well, that's nothing new. We've heard of that. Uh, ever since we've been going to church, probably. But how else is that word used in the book of Matthew? Well, if we go up to uh, chapter 8, then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. Was well, he saying, share with us the four spiritual laws so we can go to heaven when we drown? I doubt it. He's saying, save us from physical death. We're about to drown, or we could drown. Well, you get up to Matthew 9, 21, and here's a woman with an issue of blood. She said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. Well, and he said, that's not the same as the word saved. Well, it is in Greek. It's exactly the same word. As a matter of fact, we could come at this a little differently. We're going to the uh, Greek text. It's the word sozo. We'll look that up. And we find over here, get to chapter 9, verse 21, I shall be made well. I shall be made well. But, and this is supposed to have gone with me, I didn't, Matthew 9, 21. Here's the word, it's in yellow there. That is sozo. It's in a different tense. It's the same word you had in chapter 1, verse 21. You had chapter 8 where they said, save us from drowning. And now this woman says, uh, I should be made well. And the very next verse, he says, your faith, your pistis, has saved you. And the woman was saved from that hour. Saved from what? Not physical death, although it could have led to that, but physical disease. So we're seeing that the word sozo, or saved, is used many different ways in this book. Well, when we get up to chapter 16, it really gets interesting. 
Now, I want you to see that this word saved is used in verse 16, verse 25. And this is where Peter had confessed Jesus was the Christ. He gets an A for the day. He's polishing his fingers. Uh, he, Christ says, on this confession, I'll build my church. And then he says, by the way, I'm going up to Jerusalem and die. And Peter grabs him by the shoulders, pulls him aside, and says, now, Lord, you know, let me, let me consult you here a little bit. Uh, you've just made it clear, I'll probably be the one sitting at your right hand in the kingdom. And uh, I, this, this dying business, this is not conducive to setting up a kingdom. What does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. He was rebuking Peter. So Peter was all puffed up because he got the answer right as to who the Christ was. Now he's completely embarrassed. He gets the dunce cap. And what do you remember uh, in your life on test? What you get right or what you get wrong? If you're like me, you remember what you got wrong a lot longer than what you got right. Well, he got it wrong, and he never forgot it. So he wrote a whole book about what you have in Matthew 16. Let me get out of this uh, search thing, get over to Matthew 16. And let me uh, think. There, that's think. Okay, there's think. Okay, Matthew 16. So he turns to his disciples and he says, whosoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, do you see the word for right here? Do you see the word uh, for in verse 27? In fact, over here in our Greek text, we have the word for there, and then we have the for for there, and we have the word for here. That tells you you have a daisy chain of logic going on here. Each verse, with starting with four, is explaining the verse in front of it. Four, four, four. And what he's saying is that what he's teaching up here about your losing your life is connected to what's down in verse 27. So let's walk through it. For whosoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whosoever loses it for their sake, life for me, will find it. And there should be a four right here. I don't know why it's not in this text. Uh, oh, I know why. I'm using the Needs Improvement Version. Excuse me just one second. Get it right. Yeah. There we go. I was getting thrown off there just a little bit. Let me make this bigger for you. No, not that big. Okay. So, if anyone desires to come up to me, let him die himself, take his cross, and follow me. Four, verse 25. Whosoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whosoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Four, he's explaining what he just said. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world, loses his own soul, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Four. Now, you see this big gap between these verses? That was not in the Greek text. As a matter of fact, there weren't any uh, spaces between the words. And there was no punctuation. You have to know the language to kind of figure out what he's, what he's doing here. But when you see that four, you know that he's connecting this verse with the one in front of it. So that's where your daisy chain of logic comes. Four, four, and four. Okay? Now it really starts getting interesting. Would you use this verse to lead someone to heaven? I think most of you wouldn't. You'd probably go to John 3.16. You might go to Romans 3. You might go to Romans, the Romans Road, many of you. Uh, but you probably wouldn't be going into Matthew 24, because if this is how do you get to heaven, how do you get there? Well, you have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross and follow him. And he just said, I'm going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be killed. <laughs> So that's how we go to heaven? We all have to become martyrs? No, it's got to be talking about something else. And we think it is talking about something else. What is it? Well, let's keep reading here. For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whosoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Okay. So here we saw the word life and the word life. Okay. Four, now he's explaining in verse 26 what he just said in verse 25, and he says, what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own? Now he goes, soul. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? 
But if you go over here and you look at the Greek text, you go back here to verse 24, notice this word right here. That's sukane. Notice this word right here. That's sukane. But notice that's the same word you have here, sukane. And that's the same word you have here in a different uh, case, sukase. It's the same Greek word, suke, 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 connected by four. What should that tell you? It has the same meaning in both verses. You don't take two words in one verse connected by four, the same two words in the next verse connected by, connected by four, and have it have a different meaning. Why do they translate it life, life, and then soul, soul? It's because of this word save. As soon as they saw the word saved, they assumed it meant go to heaven. And therefore, they get down here and talks about saving souls. Sounds like evangelism. But again, I'm telling you, if this is evangelism, then you've got to, got to go out and tell people to sign up for the Christian army and get ready to die. It's not what it's talking about. That's what Peter wrote a book about. First Peter is a whole book about what you see right here. And let me show you from this text, though, that this is not about how to go to heaven. For... He's explaining and wrapping this whole thing up. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will do what? Hello? He's going to do what? Let me have someone online tell me what he's going to do. What does that word say? Just hit your space bar. Reward. 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 He's going to reward you. And in the New Testament, you've got to start thinking in categories if you don't already. There's a difference between position and condition. There's a difference between relationship and fellowship. There's a difference between the gift and the prize. There's a difference between justification and sanctification. And when you start talking rewards, he's talking about saving the saved. He's talking about what he's going to explain in the book of 1 Peter. He's going to reward us. Now, according to what? According to his works. Now, do you think you'll get to heaven by your works? If you're a born-again Christian, surely somewhere you've run into Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, where it says it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you can't have a contradiction where the Holy Spirit didn't write both books. So here's one that says you're, you're going to be saved according to your works, and here's one that says you're going to be saved by grace without works, which is right. Well, they're both right. The difference is in the meaning of the word saved. I've already shown you saved can mean saved from your sins to go to heaven. It can mean saved from... Physical death, drowning, it can be saved physical disease, the woman with the issue of blood. And now here we have another use of the word saved. That somehow your life can be saved. Well, what's your life? And what's it worth to you? It says here, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own life? What will a man give in exchange for his life? So Daniel, let me pick on you. Can I pick on you? You bet. All right. Uh, I haven't revealed this to you before, but I'm really a representative of Bill Gates. And he's taking a shine to Christians, and uh, he, uh, he wants to help the ministry. Uh, praise God. So, <laughs> so uh, um, he's authorized me to give you a million bucks. And I can put it in your account tonight, actually. You can draw it in the morning. But now there's just only one catch. The moment you draw on it, you'll die. Deal? Would I'll you pass. go for that deal? I'll pass. You pass on that? Well, you know, Daniel, every man has a price. And Bill's got a lot more than a million bucks. So um, how about $10 million? You can do a lot with $10 million, couldn't you? So go to the ministry or go to Greg's? No, no, this, this goes to you. <laughs> I'll be gone. Yeah, it won't do you much. What? Nope. He could give you a billion dollars, couldn't he? Yeah. What if you got offered the whole world? The devil's the god of this world. What if he offered you the whole world? He did that to someone once, didn't he? Yes, he did. Someone named Jesus. But the moment you get it, you die. See, what he's saying is, what will a man give in exchange for his life? It's the most precious thing you have. All right, but what is life? Well, let's look it up and see what the dictionary people have to say about it. Life. Here's the best one-volume dictionary in the world on the Greek of the New Testament. Here's our word, suke. What does it mean? Literally, of life on earth and its external physical aspects. That is the most precious thing you have. It's your time on earth. If I say to a, uh, uh, a freshman entering college, what do you want to do with your life? Is that a hard thing to understand? Does he understand that question? 
That's not tough, is it? He might say, well, I want to be an engineer. Or he might say, you know, I want to be a missionary. Uh, who knows what he's going to say, but he knows what I'm asking. He knows I'm talking about his time on earth from the moment I ask the question until he dies or is raptured, correct? Okay, that's what your life is. And Jesus, right here in this text, you can save it or you can lose it. Let me do my own NIV version here of what I think this is saying. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whosoever desires to save his life for his own selfish purposes will lose it. Lose what? The significance of it. The very purpose for which he was created. But whosoever in the eyes of the world will lose his life for my sake will find it. I remember when I decided to go into ministry, I was in the back seat. I decided to to tell my parents and my mother was driving down the street i was in the back seat and i told her and she i thought she was going to have a wreck but she pulled the car off the road stopped looked back at me and said that's the craziest thing i've ever heard and she told me about 10 reasons she listened all my faults it's probably more than 10 of why why i would fail and uh all my family went into medicine except me and they spent years trying to bribe even Betty and me after I was married to with seminary, going to med school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In her eyes, I was throwing my life away. But in giving it away for Jesus, I found it. I found the reason why he created me. That's what this is all about. And Peter never forgot the lesson. And so he wrote a whole book on it. And so that takes us into saving the saved. Now, you know, in these... Uh, lessons I'm giving you. I obviously can't go into detail in this whole book. So I think there are five sections to the book. There's an introduction. Well, there's a hello, salutation, introduction, body, farewell. I mean, a conclusion, a farewell. That's what we call the epistolary genre. That's just a literary form of letters. Okay. That's, that's every letter is like that. Possible exception, Hebrews. But I'm going to give you a little something from the introduction, the body, and the conclusion. Uh, the body tells you three ways to save your life for eternity. That's what the introduction is going to introduce us to, the introduction. And then three ways to do it, and then the conclusion. So I'll bring you a, a portion of scripture from each one of these sections. So there'll be five of these as we go along. Uh, today I'm jumping all the way down to uh, verses six through nine. But before we get there, I want you to see that these people have been born again. These are the Jewish Christians who are scattered abroad after the stoning of Stephen. They were being stoned and killed by Saul of Tarsus. So they scatter around the Mediterranean world and they're hurting. Uh, if you know anything about Jewish people, they usually have... Uh, a complex of business partners within themselves. So they depend on their economy for one, another, with, for one another. They were being persecuted as Jews because they weren't Gentiles. They were being persecuted by the, uh, by the Jews because they'd become Christians. Undoubtedly, uh, an electric company had turned off the lights. They were hurting. And they were hurting because they became Christians. And so Peter comes along to encourage them. His ministry was especially to Jewish Christians. And he says to them, you've been begotten again. Now, you know, born again is only used three times as a verb in the New Testament. Two of them are right here in this chapter. I just showed you one. The other one's up in verse 23, where he says, having been born again. See it? So, what tense is that? Miss Betty, what tense is having been? Is that past, present, or future? Having been born again. Past. It's past tense. So this, this is a done deal, right? These people are born again. And in our particular school, we think once you're born into a family, you can't get out of it. Even if you wanted out, you couldn't get out. There's some children that might wish they could get out of the family. And there's some parents that might wish the children could get out of the family. <laughs> I remember one teenager and his dad were having a heated argument. And finally, the uh, Teenager said, well, Dad, I didn't ask to be born. And the father said, that's right, son. If you had, the answer would have been no. <laughs> <laughs> They're stuck with each other, aren't they? 
Father, Son. That's an eternal relationship, whether they enjoy it or not. We call enjoying the relationship fellowship. But the relationship is eternal. The fellowship can be in and out, depending upon the behavior of the son, etc. You're familiar with the prodigal son. All right, all I'm trying to establish here, these people that we're talking to are already born again. He's begotten us again. That's all past. That's done. Well, then why write the letter? I remember Barbara Walters, as she was finishing up her career, said there were four interviews she wanted to give. Uh, and so finally the network allowed her to, to do them. One of them was, she said, I want to ask Christians the goal of their faith. So she went around, and of course they edit those things. I don't know, my, know how many hours of tape she gathered. But every single person she interviewed that was included in, in the presentation said, she said, well, what's the goal of the Christian life? Every one of them said to go to heaven when you die. To go to heaven when you die. And I don't have time to go into where they got that. They really got that from Plato, who was picked up by Augustine and spread it into Christianity. That the goal of the Christian life is to go to heaven when you die. That's not the goal. I'm going to show you the goal tonight. And the goal is not the starting blocks. It's a race. And the goal is the goal line. And the goal line is not the starting blocks. Don't get the goal, uh, starting blocks at the end of the race. That's at the beginning. And being begotten again is the beginning. This is where you're born again. But you're called to a race, aren't you? What's he say over in Hebrews 12? Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us, what? Run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Wow, what an exhortation. Run the race with endurance. What a challenge. What an example, looking unto Jesus. And you see this little word right here? Joy. Kind of hard to believe, isn't it? The joy that was set before him. That enabled him to go up Golgotha. That enabled him to take on the sins of the whole world. That enabled him to be separated from his father, as far as fellowship goes, for the first time ever in his existence to taste sin. Why? Because of the joy that was coming. Years ago, I was asked by a friend I was discipling on uh, uh, helping finish a marathon up in Dallas, the White Rock Marathon. Well, I'd never run that before. The furthest I'd ever run was five miles. But I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll join you for the last half. So I did that. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a Delta pilot. And I'm glad I joined him for the last half because he got disoriented three times. Uh, you hit the wall at about mile 20 in marathons, and three times he turned around and started running the other way. So I had to turn him back and finally make it. The grimaces he had on his face, I really wondered if he would make it. But let me tell you, those grimaces turned to smiles. And when he finished that race, I saw a joy within him I'd never seen before. The joy of finishing the race. That's the joy that's set before us. But I digress. We're going back to 1 Peter. And what I'd like to focus in on is verses 6 through 9. I'm doing this right. 6. There we go. I don't know why this isn't traveling with me. Close to linked. Ah, oh, not like there. There we go. First Peter 1 6. In 1905, an engineer working at a patent office wrote five papers. It was called his miracle year. Each one was of great significance. One of them wound up winning the Nobel Peace Prize, not Peace Prize, Nobel Prize for Physics. And uh, in one of the papers, not the one that won the Nobel Prize, but he studied the speed of light and he came up with what he called the principle of invariance. 
Essentially, that was saying that the speed of light doesn't change. Uh, it also became known as uh, the law of special relativity. Special relativity. He put all of his genius together and applied that law to the universe and came out with, in 1916, with general relativity. But he was uh, appalled initially by what it seemed to point out. He pointed out the universe was expanding but slowing down. There's only one thing that has those properties, and that's an explosion. Take a hand grenade, you pull the pin, and it explodes. The material from the hand grenade goes outward, but gravity and friction from the air causes the pieces to slow down until they fall. Well, he said that has implications, pretty significant implications. For example, there has to be a prime mover. Someone has to pull the pin. And so if there's this explosion that began the universe, someone had to pull that pin. And he said, that must be God. So at that point, he admitted, or he conceded, or he began to believe in God. He used to believe in God when he was younger, but this caused him to believe in God uh, again. Well, the rabbis came out of the woodwork. They were excited. They said, congratulations, uh, Dr. Einstein, for coming back to your faith. He said, oh, no, 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 no. I don't believe in the Jewish God, and I certainly don't believe in the Christian God. I believe in a God of supreme intelligence that did all this. And they said, well, wait a minute. Certainly a personal God is superior to an impersonal God. Therefore, your God of supreme intelligence, being impersonal, couldn't be God because his personal God would be superior to him. He said, oh, no, there is no personal God. I've seen too much suffering in the world for that. Uh, I went to a high school that quite a few uh, noted people around America went to. It was a prep school in Chattanooga. And years later, I was reading the autobiography of one, and the title of the book was Call Me Ted. It was Ted Turner. He talked about how he became a Christian at this school three times. I thought, well, that's interesting. How did he become a Christian three times? <laughs> but he said uh, when he watched his sister uh, die a horrendous death while she was in college, and watched his father commit suicide while he was still in college. Even though he had intended to be a missionary, he gave up his faith. Well, he was interviewed about that years later, when his wife of the time, Jane Fonda, became a Christian. They interviewed him. And he said, well, I was taught in high school that God is a loving God and he's all-powerful. But the suffering I've seen in this world says, uh-uh, that can't be. There can't be a person of God. It makes no sense whatsoever. It makes no sense. Bill Gates was interviewed about God. He married a church-going girl from Dallas, Texas. And so I began wondering what kind of influence she might have on him. He was interviewed, and he said, I find no evidence for God whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I find more evidence for the opposite because of the suffering that I, Melinda and I have seen in this world. So he's dedicated a lot of his fortune to alleviate uh, suffering. What's my point? Suffering has derailed more than one person and one intelligent person in this world. Now, you know, uh, unbelievers aren't disillusioned by suffering. They can't be disillusioned because they never believed in God. It's those who believe in God and a uh, loving God and a all powerful God and all knowing God we're the ones that can be disillusioned uh, by the suffering. And it can really rock you uh, tremendously. I've seen men leave the ministry over it. I've seen homes divorce over it many, many times, unfortunately. Quite often the death of a child will bring so much intense suffering that they can't stand being around each other for the grief, and they will, they will split. And so we need to do something with this issue of suffering. And First Peter certainly does that. Um, you know, I've read a lot of books on suffering, but I've never read what First Peter says. And all those books are good books. Every one of Dobson's got a good one. Uh, a Jewish fellow who wrote the book, Why uh, Do Good People Suffer? No, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? A lot of good ones. But I've never seen them say what Peter's saying here. So it's something I want to add to your uh, arsenal as you approach life and as you witness suffering, maybe your own life, maybe the lives of others. Uh, first of all, in uh, verse 6, 
we have the requirement of suffering in verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. And then it gives the reason for suffering, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. And now we get the reward for suffering, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your, guess what we're going to do here? Saving your soul. Uh -uh. Life. Saving of your life. That's why I went through Matthew 16 and show you it's life, 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 life that should not be translated soul. How could that be the end of your faith? Goal of your faith. You're born again, you got it. You got your ticket for heaven. Put it in your back pocket. Go to church. Dip in a little bit to keep the lights on. Go home. Live like that. No. <laughs> anyway, there is a reason to save the saved. And that's what he's talking about here. And this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while if need be. You know, I like to think of our existence in three stages. In the first stage, we are in darkness. We can't see anything, hear anything, speak anything, feel anything for all intents and purposes. And yet while we're in that womb for nine months, God is making eyes that we can't see. He's making ears so we really don't hear anything. We have tactile that we don't really touch. Smell, we can't smell anything. You say, well, gosh, what a waste of time. Why is God doing this? Well, we know the answer. It's no big mystery, is it? There's a second stage of existence, isn't there? And in that stage, we use these physical senses that God was preparing while we were in darkness. But I'd like to say the second stage is also somewhat dark. And it's much longer uh, if you have a full blessed life, 70 or 80 years. But I'd say during this stage, he's also building senses. Only this time they're spiritual and not physical. He's building taste buds to taste that the word of God is good. He's building spiritual ears to hear his still small voice. He's building spiritual eyes that you might see the world that can't be shaken when this one can be. And you say, well, why is he doing that? What a waste of time. Oh no, because there's a third stage. And that stage is for all the rest, that's for eternity. And that's where we will maximize the use of these senses that we just get a glimpse of now. We just get a glimpse of that world, but we'll use them full time there. But during this stage, there's a difference, the second stage, between the second and the first. In the first stage, for all intents and purposes, babies don't self-abort. I have that in good authority from an OBGYN doctor. But they can be aborted, but they can't self-abort. In the second stage, we can do that. We are his spiritual children. And should we choose to resist the spirit? Should we choose to quench the spirit? Should we choose to grieve the spirit? He won't force us to keep on going. He's not going to force us to follow him. He won't force us to yield to his scalpel. We may need to be led by him, and then we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So this says for a little while. He's going to go into the suffering that we go into in this life, and he says it's just a little while. He's comparing it to eternity. Over in Romans chapter 8, he talks about the sufferings of this world in verse 17. And he says, For I do not consider the sufferings of this world worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us when the sons of God are revealed. What about this word, if need be? In the language in which this Bible was written, or this New Testament, there are four ways to say, if then. If then. If then. The first way is, if and it's really true, then this will happen. The second way is, if and it's not really true, then this will happen. The third way is, if and it might probably be true, 
And the fourth one is if, and there's a remote possibility it's true. This is the first one, folks. This is the first one. This speaks of reality. You get out on the fourth one and you're the furthest removed from reality. It's just potentiality. This one is reality. And he's saying, in this you greatly rejoice, so now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Well, you need be. <laughs> this is reality. And what we're being told here is that trials, that he talks about right here, are not optional in the Christian life. They are inevitable. James says the same things when he says in the early part of his letter, rejoice when you fall into various trials. He didn't say rejoice if you fall into various trials. He said rejoice when, when you fall into various trials. That's almost what he's saying here, if need be. I remember uh, when I came to Houston to go to uh, college at uh, Rice University, I was a science guy, science and math, and it used to be Rice Institute of Technology. So I thought of going to uh, Caltech or MIT, but my father had a plane and could fly me to Rice, so I said, okay, good, great. So in orientation week, they uh, tell you what you're going to take. Yeah, so they said, well, what do you want to major in? I said, well, I want, I'll, I'll be pre-med. And they said, well, great, you get to take chemistry. I said, oh, man, I love chemistry. That's, that's so cool. And you get to take physics. Oh, I love physics. That's my favorite subject. That's cool. And you got to take calculus. I said, what? No problem. And you got to take history. I said, huh? History. How's history going to make me a better doctor? And you got to take English. English? I've been speaking English for 18 years. I don't even take English. I said, oh, yeah, we're not Rice Institute of Technology anymore. We're Rice University. I said, well, big woof. I didn't really say that. <laughs> What's that do for you? That means we want to be more well-rounded. We want well-rounded students graduate from our school. So you may be a science math guy, but we're going to help round you out. <laughs> Those were what we call required courses. I didn't enjoy them very much. But over here were some electives I enjoyed a lot. This life is like that. God has a great university. And like Rice was when I went, it was free for everybody. William Marsh Rice paid the fee so we could all go free. But once in, you have to perform or you don't graduate. Well, in the Christian life, someone else paid the price so you can be in God's university. His name was Jesus Christ. And he paid your full tuition. Completely free gift to get in, costs you nothing. But once you get in, if you want to graduate with honors, everyone will graduate, but if you want to graduate with honors, you've got to take all the courses. If need be, if need be. Some of those courses we won't enjoy so much, they're required courses. Some of them uh, we're gonna enjoy a whole, whole lot. And he actually doesn't say it here, but he says it over, it's pretty close to it here, but over in James he says, you need endurance so that get through these various trials and let endurance have this completed work that you may be complete, mature, entire, fully fitted out for the journey, he says. Over here he says that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory. That's the graduation day. So right now, if need be, you are grieved by various trials. I can't tell you the number of trials I've observed in the lives of others just this past month. Five funerals I've been to, or I've been invited to because of COVID. I really went in person to just one of them. It was Dwight Edwards' first son. Discovered when he was early in his teens that he was shuffling along and had some sort of weird disease. They had trouble diagnosing, but his muscles were shutting down on him slowly. Was he 40, Betty, when he died? 38. 38 when he died. He wound up, uh, got up to 400 pounds, went through the gastric bypass operation, got down to 300. He come to our house for Thanksgiving, had to be transported, special transportation. Found out he was somewhat retarded. Now keep in mind, his father was a professional athlete. He used to play on the European tour. He played beyond board. I asked him once, why did you really play beyond board? He has a low guttural laugh and he said, uh, uh, not very long. 
But he won the Texas 5A championship. He was a great athlete. And here he has a son who can't even walk. But that's not all. He had a third son, same thing, just younger. Possibly going through the same thing. It's been one of the saddest things of suffering I've ever witnessed in my life. Um, how do you deal with that? Those are the kind of things that derail people. Various trials. Well, that only happens to those other people. Reminds me of the subway in New York. Have you ever been there? And down the subway and when it's busy, see how busy it can be? Story goes that uh, they line up, you know, the guy's first in line, they're waiting. Here comes the subway speeding in, the doors open up, and the guy had gotten motion sickness who was ready to get off, and he just erupted all over the first guy in line wanting to get on. Everyone was so stunned, the doors closed, and off went the subway into the night. And the man there with his trial dripping all over himself turned around to the man behind him and said, Why me? <laughs> yeah, why me? And there may be times when trials hit you that you thought were, no, that happens to the other guy, not me. Not me. That doesn't happen to me. It might. But there's a purpose for it all. And let me be clear here. Uh, trials and suffering fall into categories. There is deserved suffering and undeserved suffering. I fell once uh, and broke 28 bones from a motorcycle wreck. You know, there are very few people that came to visit me from my own church. Because they're saying, deserve suffering, that stupid idiot. What's that pastor doing on that bike? <laughs> I couldn't argue with him. I deserved every bit of that. That's not what Jane or what uh, Peter's talking about. The suffering in Peter is undeserved suffering. As a matter of fact, when we get to chapter 4, he says it's suffering because you're a Christian sometimes. Uh, it's suffering because of righteousness' sake, sometimes that you that you run, go through various trials. But he says in the midst of that, that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold, and it perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise. So the genuineness of your faith, uh, this particular word, uh, genuineness, is dakimos, and it's talking about finding that which is at bringing out of the impurities out of metals. It's not saying the gold isn't real gold. It's not saying it's fake gold, but it's bringing out the impurities. And the fire, the furnace heats up the gold, a slag comes off from the top, and the gold is more pure. Now, the only way you got into God's family was through faith, by grace through faith. Okay? By faith, not works. So that's your first step of faith in your Christian life. But Romans says, the righteousness of God, verse 17, is revealed from faith to faith. The just shall live by faith. Did you hear that? The just, people who are already born again, shall live their Christian life by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, Hebrews tells us. Jesus said, when I come back, will I find faith on the earth? That's what he's looking for. He's looking for faith. So he's trying to develop our faith. And that's what he says trials can do. As they bring out the impurities in our faith, the faith becomes finer. And the finer the faith, the greater the glory. Not for us, for him. Being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. So the uh, reality uh, of our suffering uh, is given to us in verse 6. The reason for our suffering is in verse 7 and 8. And finally, the reward of our suffering down here in verse nine. He says, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Well, I'm saying this is suke, should be translated life. Again, what's your life? Your time on earth. And this is the amazing concept that I started off with. This is what 
brought Dwight Edwards out of the world of tennis into what he is doing now. This is what brought Dr. Ken Wilson out of a life of just medical prestige into a life that's reaching all over the world through his incredible teaching. He's now considered the leading Augustinian scholar in the world. Just absolutely amazing. It's that they realize that there's more to it than getting your ticket for heaven. That that's not the goal of the Christian life. See this word end right here? That is this word right here. In English, that would be T-E-L-O-S, telos. What English words do we get from that? Design. Tele. Telephone. Vision. Hmm? Television. Television. Telegraph. Telescope. Telescope. Telegraph. Telegraph. Right. Yeah. It's the far off part that you're getting there. A sound, phoneme, far away, telephone. Writing, far away, telegraph, etc. So if we, if we look this one up, you'll see. And, but, it also has the meaning, as I think it does here, of oops, skip right over. Moving too fast here. There. Goal. This is the goal toward which a movement is being directed. The goal of your faith, the goal of your faith is not to get in heaven when you die. Those are the starting blocks. I remember I was looking with anticipation at the Beijing Olympics because Hussein Bolt was in a position where he might break a world record in 100 meters. Now, I could, couldn't go to China. I had to watch it on television. But can you imagine if Bolt gets down on the starting blocks with the other runners, the gun goes off, and the TV man keeps the camera on the starting blocks? And 10 seconds later or so, a little less than that, it's over, and you're yelling and screaming at home in your living room saying, I wanted to watch the race! I wanted to watch the race! And you're still stuck on the starting blocks. That's the way much of Christianity has been for the past so many, many centuries. People just focusing on the starting blocks. That's why there's so little discipleship in so many churches. That's why they're preoccupied with how many souls are saved. Again, misusing this passage, I believe. And so what we're finding out here is it is a race. Now, don't misunderstand me. You can't get in the race if you don't get in the starting blocks. Agreed? Mr. Coldwater, is that right? Yeah. All right. You got to get in the starting blocks to get in the race. So that's the huge important step, the most important decision you'll ever make in your life, to trust him as your savior, to get in the starting blocks. But when the gun goes off, when that's when you're born again, now there's a race. And let's go a little further into it here. Receiving. Now, this is also a very interesting word, receiving. Because it is this word right here. And that is pronounced, that would be like in, we actually get an English word from this. Uh, when it starts with C, C-O-M. This is pronounced commizo. If I change the Z sound to S, I bet you'll get it. Commission. What English word do we get? Commission. commission. And what is a commission? Something of a reward or a payment for work that you've done, right? Or maybe a sale you've made it's or something like that. Isn't it? What's that? An authority. You've been given an authority to do something. Well, that's a little different use. I'm speaking in terms of a commission of sales might, no, might make from selling it. something. But it is always receiving back for work that is done. Uh, like. Uh, here, there, this word hopsonia means wages, and it's to pay wages, it's to receive the wages. It's a reward. It can be a reward for wrongdoing. Uh, here is the mistha, the reward of adikia, that's wrongdoing. My point is, it's not a free gift, it's something you get for doing something. And here he is, you're receiving the goal of your faith, and what is the goal of your faith? The salvation of your suke. Saving the saved. 
They're already saved in the sense of going to heaven. We saw they're born again in verse 3 and 4, right? And now we go through these trials and you say that's required. If you say that's required to get in heaven, that's Roman Catholicism. We might as well practice that faith. Because they think by works, you add to your justification as you go through life. We say, no, you're not made righteous as you go through life by getting more and more of Christ. You're declared righteous in the courtroom of heaven the moment you trust in Christ. Your sins are removed from the debit column as far as the east is from the west. And the righteousness of Christ's perfect life is credited to your credit column. And uh, that's called the imputed righteousness of Christ. All that happens the moment you're born again. But now you're in a race. The race is to see how much of my time on earth will count for eternity. An easier way to put that is, will my life have any eternal significance? Will there be a difference in this world because I lived? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the things you need to live that life will be provided for you. God has given us a, a cause, transcendent cause to live for. It transcends the problems of this life. Doesn't mean you won't have them. They're inevitable. Part of his university. But it rises above all that and allows you to keep going in the midst of all that. You can actually draw closer and closer to Christ through those things. My wife and I go off the dreaded call on February 23rd, 2003, about 4.30 or 5 in the morning. Come down to the morgue. We're down to the basement of Ben Tov. Identify your son. He's been killed by a drunk driver. Walking across the street. Now, as a pastor, I'd seen uh, people in my church divorce over this. So I kind of wondered what, how this was going to affect us. By his grace, it drew us closer together. And closer to him. In fact, we entered kind of a, a, a bubble, and I thought it was just a protective bubble that would probably leave, and I didn't know when, six months, a year, but it never left. And this gave us a plane of living with Christ that we'd never known before. And there have been some trials since then that have kept drawing us closer and closer. In fact, our marriage is better today than it ever has been. We were trying to figure that out one night, and we realized, well, you know, we're losing our minds. And we really can't remember why we're mad at each other. I know there's a good. I know I'm supposed to be mad at you right now. I just can't remember why. <laughs> it's a great time of life, but it hasn't been without its trials. Do you see what I'm saying here, folks? Uh, it's one of the greatest things uh, God ever gave us: the chance to run this race. Now, uh, don't get confused by rewards. Because what we're saying here is really going to be measured at the judgment seat of Christ. The salvation of your life, how much of your time on earth counts for eternity, will be measured by the rewards he gives you at the judgment seat of Christ. And people say, well, that's selfish. No, 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 no. Uh, they're pictured as gold, silver, and precious stones. What do you do with those? What do you make crowns? Revelation 4, verse 10 says we cast those crowns at his feet. And say he alone is worthy to wear them. All the rewards do, now some rewards accrue directly to us, intimacy with, with our Savior. Uh, but these rewards that I'm talking about uh, bring more glory to him. So the greater the rewards, the more the glory for him. The finer the faith, the greater the glory. Greater the glory. Um, and there are going to be a lot of surprises. I uh, was a youth pastor in Dallas for four years. And uh, well, let me say this first. I didn't grow up in a um, home where we all knew Jesus. We went to church, but it was just nominal. It was sort of the, the thing to do. And uh, so I didn't learn hymns growing up. I didn't learn any spiritual song. My mother took us to musicals. South Pacific, West Side Story, and, uh, Brigadoon, and all these things. One uh, was not a stage play, but it, it was a movie about Hans Christian Andersen, the uh, Dutch story writer. And, it, uh, of course, they turned it into a musical. And uh, Hans is being played by uh, Danny Kaye. And uh, he comes to a point in the movie where he's telling a story to a bunch of kids, about 25 of them. And off to the side is a, a little boy 
all by himself and his head is shaved and he looks pretty forlorn and lonely. And so just ad hoc, uh, Hans makes up a story about, guess what? The ugly duckling. You all have heard that story before. Uh, of course, in the show, it's a musical. So he says, there once was an ugly duckling with feathers all shabby and brown. And all the other birds in so many words said, get out of town. Get out. Get out. Get out of town. So he went with a quack. I won't. I won't. I'll spare you the rest. But you get the idea. And you know what happened. He hid himself away all through the wintertime. He hid himself away. And finally, in the spring, what happens? He comes out, and he's the most beautiful bird in the pond. He's not an ugly duckling at all. He's a swan. Much of this life, we feel like ugly ducklings. But I guarantee God is doing a transformative work in your life, if you let him. You can quench him. You can resist him. You can grieve him. But if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, you have fellowship with him, and the blood of Christ will keep on cleansing you from all sin. I was going to tell the story of Craig Powell, who was in my youth group. Craig had cystic fibrosis. In those days, most of those kids didn't make it to age 20. They would die when they were young. Uh, he made it through four years with me as I was his youth pastor. He was the a prototypical 90-pound weakling. He couldn't walk uh, properly. He had to shuffle along. He drooled a little bit. He had a bad case of acne. A bit of an embarrassment to the other kids. They tolerated him, but... He was the ugly duckling of our group. But I took this group out to Love Field in Dallas, an airport at the time there, and uh, we would share our faith and nothing pushy. You'd take a clipboard and ask if you saw someone alone, if they had time to take a religious survey. If they said no, you just move on. If they said yes, you take it. And then you say, well, 80% of the people we talk to find they have a desire for a more personal relationship with God. Are you one of those? They say yes, then we say, well, may I share with you how? If they say no, you move on. If they say yes, so you never push. For four years, all the years we did that, Craig never missed a Sunday. He did it once a month. On Sunday night, we still had services, and the uh, uh, pastor would let the youth share once a month when they, after they went. They'd go in the afternoon after church, Sunday morning church, come back to Sunday evening church. He'd let them share. Well, you know, high school kids in front of a crowd, they're shy. But Craig was always the first one down. He'd be about halfway back, and he'd limp all the way down that aisle. And he'd turn around, and with his toothy smile, I mean, it wasn't a pretty smile, uh, teeth sticking everywhere, he would share what the Holy Spirit had done that day. Well, I graduated from seminary and came down to Conroe to start a church, but I kept in touch with uh, Craig. And he'd call every once in a while, or I'd call him. And after I'd been in Conroe for a couple of years, he was in college by then, and he called and said, Dave, I can't get a date. And I thought to myself, oh, man. I know no one's going to marry me, but I just want someone to talk to. I didn't know what to say. Whatever it was, I'm sure it was inadequate. Then I didn't hear from Craig for a few months. So I called up and his mother answered and said, well, Craig died. Craig died. Now I'm here to tell you, when I get to heaven, when you get to heaven, you're going to meet Craig Powell. No longer an ugly duckling. One of the most... <laughs> One of the most beautiful birds on the heavenly pond. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Because he saved his life. Now, I think we've got about 10 minutes for questions, if I'm correct. Is that right, Daniel? Yeah. You've got plenty of time. As long as they want to stay on, we'll <laughs> entertain them. You don't have anything to do, right? Well, believe it or not, I have a haircut appointment, but it's not till 9.15. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, in this COVID time, I almost grew a ponytail a few months back. <laughs> I hadn't been one to one for six months. Uh, any questions out there? I know there are 50 people online, so you can, yeah. Mm -hmm.
the last four words of, of verse 9. Yeah. The second word is salvation. Uh-huh. Could you explain that a little further? Sure, sure. Do you, you remember what we said about saved when we started? Right. That's so, so the verb. This is the noun. It's the same, it's the same word, only it's a noun. Uh, here we are. It would imply that there is a negative connotation here, possible. The salvation of your soul. It's not your soul. Though. Or your salvation of your life, okay. Uh-huh. Oh, well, explain that to me. What do you mean by a negative connotation? That there has to be, what's going on is a, a step where you go from loss to gain. Uh, right. Where you go from, where, you, where somebody's you know, life is in jeopardy versus their life is no longer in jeopardy. Correct. Uh, the, the term salvation, it, it sounds like as if it's a... Uh, uh, well, you're right, but that's what we were saying, Matthew. 16, your life can be saved or your life can be lost. And it's based on whether you live for yourself or you live for Christ. Right. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. He's going to explain how by doing that, mm -hmm. you will actually save your life for eternity. So that would be the salvation of your life. But by not doing that, not being willing to sacrifice for his kingdom and his cause, but living my entire time on earth for my kingdom, my cause. Okay, I see what you're saying. Then I will lose. The distinction is what I'm trying to Yes, make. sir. Yes. Then I will lose that time. Uh, Paul's wording says, redeem the time. Okay. Because the days are evil. And so he says, as we walk along through this earth, we can. Uh, yeah. In fact, I'm discipling one of my grandchildren right now, and we're going through this book at his, at his request. He's somewhat learning challenge, so we go really slowly, and we go over and over and over. And uh, so I said, well, uh, Drew, let's pretend you had, a, you had a bank account in heaven. Well, instead of saving money, we're going to save days. And each day you live for Jesus goes ka-chink into your savings account in heaven. But each day you don't live for Jesus, this is simply lost. And the more days you live for him, the larger your account in heaven will be. So that when uh, you appear before him, he will reveal to you the size of your bank account. And the size of your bank account will be the days that you live for him and his glory. Mm -hmm. The days you live for yourself are lost forever. Okay? And he, he's able to tie into to that. So I make him each week start over and explain it all to me. And through repetition, he's, he's slowly getting. Okay, I get it. Yes, Miss Debbie? Well, I mean, so it's not just a whole day. It can be hour by hour, living in the flesh or living in, in, the, in the spirit, right? That's a good point. So it's... Can you all hear? Can Emily, can you hear what was just said? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. Um... So, I mean, there's a certain amount of wood, hay, and stubble that's going to go, you know, Poof, it's yeah. just going to get yeah. burned, burned up at the judgment seat. Well, think of it in terms of uh, 1 John 1, fellowship. Uh, I might be rocking along, doing okay, being led by the Spirit, and something caused me, let's say, or I let something uh, make me angry. Nothing can make you angry. You have to let it make you angry. And I slip over into the flesh. Don't you laugh at me? <laughs> <laughs> Who lets wives come to these things? <laughs> it's a trial. I rejoice. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you uh, slip it in the flesh, and uh, you're in the flesh for, let's say, six hours. And you realize you're wrong, and you come to God, and you confess that sin, and now you're walking by the Spirit again. Well, I think those four hours, or six hours are lost. Which is your point, I think, and that's that's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Other thoughts? Yeah, Mark. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, started a little bit late, so you might have said more on this uh, mm -hmm. uh, before we got here. But I've always heard of a suke uh, being translated as soul. So uh -huh. when you uh, say it means life, uh, if you could give me just a little more uh, sure. of your reasoning uh, for that. No problem. 
Here's the, here's the word, suke. Now this is used 105 times in the New Testament. Okay. Only five of them are referenced to what you talked about. Okay. The other half of your time on earth, and the other half, I'm saying half, it's not quite a half, is your mind, emotion, will, your inner personality, yeah, or what okay. we call your psyche. Soul. Yeah, okay. psyche. Not soul. Right. Psyche. Okay. Psychology is what? The study, is study of psyche. your psyche. And they're not studying your soul. Mm -hmm. You're studying your mind, emotion, and will. Mm -hmm. That's your psyche. So half the time it means that. Half the time it means your time on earth. And only a few times does it mean what the first meaning you came up with. So I don't know who gave you your information. Mm -hmm. But if you were to make a dictionary yourself and just walk through, like look at the first use. Uh, Arise, uh, take this young child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's soul, no, his life. Yeah. Uh, here's Jesus in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your soul. No, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will put on. It is not life more than food and body more. Than... So I, I won't go through all these. Yeah. But you can do it on your own if you like. And it's one of the assignments that I give people when I teach them how to do exegesis. Okay. Just take this word, you go through, you tell me what it means. And I think you'll discover that it's, it's majority use is really your time on earth. What do you want to do with the rest of your life, Mark? You understand that? Exactly. That's suke. Okay. okay. One, of, one of the uses. There are four uses. One time it just means uh, people. I'll show you that one. That's one of the four uses. Book of Acts, if I can get there. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, they heard Peter's sermon, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000, we would say people, wouldn't we? Yeah, yeah 3,000 people. So that's, that's another year. So then fear came upon every soul. Is that the way we talk? No, we say. King James. Yeah, yeah, but we're not King James. Fear came upon every everybody, every person. More questions? Dave, I have a question. I'm Leona from uh, North uh, North Texas as well, and uh -huh. your study. And I appreciate uh, I appreciate the work you're doing here. I followed you and uh, Kim Simmons and and Dwight and a few others oh. in the Grace Theology. Uh, yeah, been a member of the GES for quite some time. And during the raising of my children, it was a very hard struggle to describe to them uh, a rewards theology and, and salvation and how they differ. Uh, because when they became believers, uh, and I told them about the grace that uh, they were purchased at the cross, uh, and they began to read some of the uh, uh, scriptures, and they would see this salvation of the soul. Uh, type or salvation of the life, uh, they would start to say, well, I guess I need to work for it. Uh, so two things come up for me uh, in my teaching with them. And one was, we always have to ask ourselves, save from what? Uh, is it eternal damnation? Is it, you know, uh, perishing uh, from lack of food? Uh, and the second thing is, and I'm hoping that you'll uh, give me a challenge on this. Um, I've taught them that sin was paid for at the cross. There was a judgment on sin, and Jesus took that penalty on himself. At the Bema, I taught them that obedience will be judged, that no sin will be there, because God cannot bring us into sin, and he's wiped our sin debt out. So the wood, hay, and straw our works that I started to do that may have came out very fruitful, but I didn't finish them. Not about sin or our disobedience, because again, I think that that penalty and uh, everything on, on that debit account has been paid for by Jesus. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, you, you, you've hit a, uh, one is highly debated. Uh, but what helps me is to think in categories again. There is position and condition. In our position, all the sins, past, present, and future, are taken care of at the cross, buried at the bottom of the sea, removed as far as the east is from the west, turned whiter than snow, etc. That's for your position. But when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you're not being judged for your position. 
That's already settled or you wouldn't even be there. Only believers show up at the judgment seat of Christ. Your eternal destiny is settled with God forever. All right? But in your condition on earth, you live for him or against him or do good or bad. That is distinguished at the judgment seat of Christ. For he says in verse 9, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. That's, that's, our, that's our goal, to be well-pleasing. Why? Here's that little word for again. For we must all appear. He's giving a reason. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in its body according to what he's done, whether good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Why would he say that if there weren't any sort of uh, accounting for the bad? It wouldn't make any sense to say to find, according to what he has done, whether uh, what he has done, just the good things, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. He's persuading men because the Lord is going to burn up uh, the bad, the wood and stubble. Uh, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, so to speak, using parabolic language. There will be extreme grief. Remember, the promise of no more tears, no more crying, no more death isn't until Revelation 21. And that's the new Jerusalem, the eternal state. But in the millennial period, babies are born and they cry. They better cry or they're not going to breathe. <laughs> Little sinners are born. There's death in the millennium. There's sorrow. There's grief. And the uh, judgment seat of Christ is before that even. So uh, what I think we could say, and let's see if I can get up a... Uh, something that would show this. The... Judgment. Okay, let's try this. Uh, I can't build it. Uh, try this. Uh, there are two judgment seats. One for believers, one for unbelievers, and separated by probably a thousand seven years. Gonna work. Work, work, work. Okay. Why didn't that come up there? Can oh, yep. you see that? So here, this yellow thing is the rapture. I'd be able to make that bigger. Go play from current play from slide. Start. Current slide. Play from. That's right there. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> okay. Technology. Yeah. Now where'd the cursor go? <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay. So the rapture takes place. Here, believers are judged. Then a thousand seven years later, unbelievers are raised, and the great white throne takes place at that point. So there's the judgment seat of Christ. You don't get there unless you have faith. And over there is the great white throne. You don't get there unless you don't have faith. You don't get to the first one by your works, and you don't get to the second one by your works. But at the first one, you're judged for your works, and at the second one, you're judged for your works. So uh, we think the extreme sorrow and grief, the shame, that 1 John 2.28, is shame over a wasted life, perhaps? or shame over outright rebellion or sin, because then we will see him as he is, we'll see ourselves as we are, and there'll be great regret if we have uh, lived for the flesh or lived just for ourselves. Um, and that is, uh, I don't think he's going to take you out back and whack you a hundred times for every sin. Uh, that's the positional judgment, but the judgment of your condition on earth will be uh, the loss of uh, what might have been to a great degree. Does that make any sense, or does that help at all? It's certainly, uh, um, just the, I think maybe I transitioned the words and and probably brought them more confusion in their in their adulthood <laughs> by telling them, you know, it was about obedience, not necessarily about sin uh, at the judgment seat of Christ. Like I might get up today 
and yeah. I may not sin for a while. And then the Lord prompts me to go and see my neighbor. I have no idea, but I get my coffee. I go out on the porch. I totally forget about it. Uh, so that is an incomplete work or, or something that I think would be categorized in the wood, hay, or straw. I, I get my coffee. I walk out in the yard even thinking I'm going to go see my neighbor. I don't complete it. And so that goes out as well. So I think what I was trying to encourage them to do is take a look at their lives and their commitment to obedience and the glory of God at, mm -hmm. as they went forward and not be captured by the power of sin to what to which they were free from. Um, well, I, I mean, that's, that's I have to applaud you. That's all good. And what mother who knows the Lord wouldn't want to teach her children that? <laughs> but I think this concept of saving the soul, or what we're calling the life, can open up a whole new uh, vista for, I've seen it for uh, for a lot of people. Any final questions? How are you, Jim Hughes? I had one. Did it? Yeah. Uh, since James has written to the uh, Jewish believers as they were scattered out, as well as Peter, how would you say they relate? Uh, do you think, and I know it's two different authors, but you still have the commonality of the Holy Spirit, but when was one written, when was the other, and what do you think God's purpose was in sharing those two books to Jewish believers? Now, I, I, Byron, I missed, did you say James and Peter? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Well, we think James might have been the first New Testament book written. Uh, if, if you look in Galatians, he seemed to be kind of over the church there in Jerusalem. And of course, the persecution went out from Jerusalem. So he was seen as, as, as a leader among those Christian Jews. And a word from him, from him in the midst of their suffering would have meant a lot. And of course, he says it's to those of the diaspora, okay? Uh, but First Peter, we think, was uh, probably written in the 60s, you know, maybe 20 years later. And uh, he also says he's writing to the diaspora. But if you look further uh, at the introduction, he says the dispersion, but in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, that's Turkey. That's Turkey. So uh, he had a more limited, a lot of these were circular letters among the churches in an area. Uh, and so uh, he probably had a, a smaller uh, group that he was looking at here. And of course, uh, we don't know that James traveled where Peter did. Uh, yeah. They have complementary truths. Uh, the beautiful thing about James, I think, is he includes the deserved suffering. And in my life, most of my suffering, I haven't put it on a scale, but I would doubt that most of my suffering isn't deserved. Brought on by my own foolishness or my own sins. And uh, if all I could rejoice in or find benefit from were my undeserved suffering, then there would be a lot of discouragement, I think, in my life. But uh, uh, James says, uh, uh even, even the deserved suffering. Uh, God is so great when he says he works all things together for our good, to those who love God and are called according to his purpose, that all things include even my sin. I had a Bible study teaching leader come up to me once, and she was rather short, and I'm 6'4", and she looked up at me and she said, I just don't see how my sin can glorify God. And I didn't want to embarrass her, but I walked away thinking, uh, remember something called the cross? Put Jesus on that cross. It's my sin and your sin. And the greatest glorification that God has ever had for his son on this earth was what happened at the cross. Where his justice met his love. And Mercy triumphed over justice. Well, why don't we stop there? Thank you for being here. Uh, I guess we're off next week. Is that right? Seven days from now. You're, yep, we're back on next Tuesday night. Okay. Thank God bless. You.
Thank you all for coming. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for tuning in, folks. Thank you. Good night. Good night.